Welcome to the Governance Podcast from the Centre for the Study of Governance and Society here at King's College London. I'm Mark Pennington, the Director of the Centre and Head of the Department of Political Economy where the Centre is based. We're delighted to have with us today Professor Elizabeth Anderson. Elizabeth is John Dewey Distinguished University Professor of Philosophy and Women's Studies and Arthur F. Fennell Professor and Department Chair of Philosophy at University of Michigan. Elizabeth's work lies at the interface between social science and moral and political theory, with specialisms in feminist theory, social epistemology, and the philosophy of economics. She's written widely on these topics and is the author of several important books, including Value in Ethics and Economics, The Imperative of Integration, and most recently, Private Government, How Employers Rule Our Lives. I'm delighted to say she's recently been granted one of the prestigious MacArthur Foundation Genius Grants, and I think it's safe to say that Elizabeth is one of the world's leading political philosophers. So Elizabeth, it's great to have you with us here today at the Centre. How does it feel to be the recipient of a Genius Award? (laughs) Well, it feels really great, but I do want to push back a little bit on the genius thing. (laughs) There's actually been a lot of research done on the correlation between Uh, the belief that in order to be successful in a discipline, you had to be a genius and what percentage of women are in the field. Mm -hmm. Uh, The more people think you have to be a genius, the fewer women and philosophy sort of off the charts in the belief that you got to be a genius to do it. I'm a firm believer that philosophy is for everyone. Anyone can do philosophy. In fact, everyone does philosophy whenever they reflect on any moral or political issue and wonder what's right or just. So I don't think philosophy is particularly difficult. It does require the application of discipline. uh, And I I hope in pushing back against that, I can encourage more women to enter and uh, bring down the ego level of my discipline. Mm -hmm. So just following up on that, I mean, what is the sort of ratio of of, uh, of women in philosophy in major departments at the moment? I mean, is that, is that well, something that is Well, I do have or? U.S. data, and yep. <clears throat> it's about a quarter, one in quarter. four, yeah. which is pretty crazy. I mean, in biology, for instance, about 50-50. Yeah. So philosophy and physics are the two outliers, and economics yeah. is pretty close there as yeah. well. But most of the other disciplines are much better gender integrated. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's really interesting. So could you tell us a little bit about what you actually plan to do with the MacArthur? Uh, <laughs> I'm going uh, to be buying out my time because I have a giant uh, research agenda, mm-hmm. uh, lots of books uh, in progress and projected, so I need the time to be writing. Yep. So could you give us a little bit of a sense of what those books are, are about? Is it going to be a development of your recent work looking at basically the the governance of employment, I guess, is how we could we could describe what you've been working on recently. Yes. So one of the books I'm currently working on is about the history and legacy of the Protestant work ethic. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a follow on to private government. Yeah. Uh, thinking about the role that the work ethic has played both in the history of political thought and in the history of public policy in the UK and the US, which are sort of the extreme work ethic mm-hmm. <laughs> societies from really strongly influenced by the work ethic. Uh, so that's one book, but I, I just recently I came from Oxford University where I gave the Uhura lectures, and that's on a totally different topic. It's, it's about the ethics of political communication in a mm-hmm. polarized age. Yep. And that's also, I think, highly relevant both for the U.S. context and for the U.K. and even many countries in Europe that are riven by populist politics. Mm-hmm. So is there anything, any particular sort of line of argument that you're developing there in that, in that work on communication? Well, populist politics is a politics of finding enemies within. Mm-hmm. And so it's based on sowing distrust among citizens. And I think the key goal to sustain a democratic society is to rebuild trust between citizens. And that requires adopting modes of communication that uh, disarm fear and resentment and the other emotions that are uh, making people feel antagonistic to each other across social identities. Mm. That's a pretty challenging area. (laughs) 
in the contemporary context, that's for sure. <laughs> it is, but I think that's really the challenge we have to face if yep. we want to rescue democracy. Yeah. Actually enabling people to speak to each other, and you, even if they, they disagree quite profoundly. I mean, that seems Correct. to be one of the great challenges. Yes, but um, that's really what democracy, that's what democratic practice, I think, has to be. We, yeah. we have a plural, all democracies are deeply pluralistic, and we have to learn to talk to each other, even, even with profound disagreements and not assume that the other person is some existential threat yeah yeah okay well if if i may let's let's go on to talk about some of the themes i think which relate to the to the work of the center Mm -hmm. which is really around thinking about governance arrangements the relationship between formal and informal governance structures uh and in your case you've done this really interesting work on thinking about what i would describe as the governance of the work relationship employment uh, relationships. And that work, as I understand it, really builds on a lot of your previous work thinking about what equality means or should mean, discussions of equality. So in your previous work, you've challenged kind of luck egalitarian arguments, which think about equality in terms of sort of compensating people in various ways for various differences that they might have or disadvantages they might have to focus on an account of equality as non-domination in essence. And that theme comes across very strongly in this work you've done on the governance of the employment relationship, that we should be thinking about uh, good governance and employment relations as being about non-domination. And you make this interesting argument that thinkers on the left, you think, should recognize that historically uh, pro-market arguments have been arguments about trying to avoid domination. So in the past, people were supportive of free trade or removing various kinds of restrictions. But you suggest that in recent discourse, people have forgotten that. And I guess this is an argument you're making against people on the right, broadly conceived, that the nature of the Industrial Revolution was such that the employment relationship changed to one where employment, instead of necessarily being an area where people could be liberated, is one where they can be dominated by uh, employers. As I understand the argument, you're not opposed to the kind of hierarchies that exist in firms as such, as organisations, but you are opposed to effectively unaccountable hierarchy. That is is that a fair summary of the, the, yes. the position that you hold? Yes. So the general picture is whenever you have a large-scale organization designed to deliver some product or service, uh, some kind of hierarchy of offices is virtually inevitable. You can't yeah. run participatory democracy yeah. on a really big, large-scale, complex organization you have to divide it up into offices, and then there'll be heads of those offices and so forth, and they'll have to report up the chain of authority. <clears throat> I think that is inherent in, in in these complex organizations, but the issue is, are is everybody in that chain of authority accountable for their behavior? And accountability is not just accountability to make sure that the product or service that's being uh, created is actually delivered, but also accountability to the other people in the organization who are who lie under that authority. Hmm. So private government is government that is unaccountable to those governed. Hmm. And my argument is that uh, certainly in the United States, but I, I think in many uh, European workplaces as well, uh, we do see private government. And that's really problematic because when you get unaccountable power, uh, people abuse it mm-hmm. and workers suffer. And that's what domination is all about. Yeah, I mean, you make some really quite quite strong and provocative claims in the, in the, in the, in the book, uh, arguing in effect that some of the powers that employers have are equivalent almost to those that you see in dictatorial regimes. I mean, I think at one point you say it's almost like the management structure of firms is like a communist dictatorship, which is a bit of a provocative yes. claim. <laughs> um, well, part of that's just, just trying to... I, I'm trying to provoke libertarians yeah. here who I think just have a kind of magical a rosy view. view. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But what you're really concerned about is, as you say, not the idea of there being hierarchies, but the idea that these are, in some sense, unaccountable to those who are subject to them. Yes. Um, and you list in the book, in the book Private Government, um, a number of examples of what looked like 
um, I think to anybody's um, you know sight to be pretty horrendous abuses yes. of the power that bosses or administrators in in large companies actually have. Um, can you give us you know just walk us through a few of the kind of examples that you highlight in the in the book? Yes. So here I'm speaking particularly in the U.S. context, which uh, American workers have far fewer labor rights than are secured under the regulations of the European Union. American slaughterhouse workers are deprived of access to the bathroom for their entire shift and are told to come to work wearing diapers. That's nappies in, in nappies. UK. Nappies, in UK nappies, parlance. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> just imagine the indignity of that, mm-hmm. not to mention the health hazards involved if they're also processing meat. We also have uh, workers who are told that they're not allowed to speak to their co-workers during their entire shift because that amounts to time theft, stealing time from their employer. They have to be nose to the guy grindstone every second of their shift. In addition, American employers commonly regulate workers' lives, even off-duty. Workers have been fired for making political contributions to candidates that the boss disapproved of. They've been forced to attend political rallies for candidates the boss approves of, or they would suffer lost wages if they don't show up for that. Uh, they're pressured to make campaign contributions to the political action committee of their firm and monitored if they fail to make such contributions. They can be fired for their choice of partner. So all these off-duty activities that we imagine ought to be free, and I think they ought to be free and really none of the boss's business, in fact, in the United States are subject to the uh, employer regulation. Yeah, I mean, it really is very challenging when in the book, the way you you list these kind of practices. I mean, they strike, I think most people would think that they are, you know, there's something that sort of gets in your gut that you react against. I know that was my sense when I read about this. But I was also thinking, and this, I guess, is a bigger question for thinking about political philosophy um, and how we think about what the best way of dealing with problems is, is how you situate um, an understanding of the kind of abusive relationships that happen in these kind of corporate employment relationships with actually many other aspects of life. How do they compare? So if we're thinking about, you know, the kind of arrangements that may make things better or worse on these dimensions, then we need some kind of baseline almost to think about the other sources that there might be of domination. Um, so, I mean, I guess the argument here would be human beings aren't always very humane. And this is true in all aspects of life. Mm-hmm. So if we're thinking about the role that this private government, as you describe it, uh, plays in either in contributing to domination, we also need to have an understanding of the sources of domination outside of work. And I didn't feel reading the book that, that you said all that much about that. So, so if, I, if I give an example, I mean, um, you know, there are some illustrations in, in the book about um, abuses of women, for example, mm-hmm. uh, in the employment relationship. Um, but to make my point, I think I would be saying well, we know that women are abused outside yeah. of work. Sure. Is there any sense that it's better or worse in the employment relationship than it is in the outside world? Um, it seems to me that that's quite an important consideration. Could, could you speak to that issue a little bit? So there is, uh, there's enormous variety in, in in how much domination takes place in both the domestic sphere and in the employment domain, and there are interactions. Yeah. So the worse the conditions are for women in employment, the more vulnerable they are to domestic violence at home. Mm -hmm. And similarly, women who have, who enjoy uh, much better treatment at work uh, tend to also have quite a lot of autonomy at home. This is strongly correlated with class, income, professional status. Yeah. But do you, 
so the things that you say, the things that are inter, in, inter, interacting in that way, that makes that makes a lot of sense to me. But do you have a sense of, um, I mean, do we have data, for example, on the relative prevalence of um, some of these kind of abuses um, that take place in the corporate environment relative to what happens in other aspects of life? Ah, uh, you know, I'm not aware of any. Someone might have looked at it, but I'm not aware yeah. of that. Yeah. The re- the reason I'm thinking about that, I mean, I'm thinking I'm thinking of other examples of, you know, there are, some of the examples that you list are really examples of bullying mm-hmm. of a ve- of, of of a kind. Yeah. Um, but we know that bullying happens in in many aspects of Absolutely. life. Absolutely. Yes. You know, I mean, I remember, you know, to be frank, I, I hated school because yeah, I was right. bullied at school. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so you can have bullying in the family. You can have bullying. From other workers, for example, workers Quite bullying right. each other. Yeah. So these are common human traits that, you know, as I say, people are not always very humane. Um, and I, I guess what I'm asking is, where do we have evidence to look whether actually within corporations is it a particular problem? Is it a particular problem in corporations relative to other areas? Or actually, might there even be a case for saying in some dimensions within organizations, uh, it's better? than can be the case outside. I mean, I don't know. Do we have any data on those kind of comparisons? So I'm not aware of data on on, on this. Uh, I think it's an interesting question. Um, but I think wherever bullying happens, we ought to look into policy responses that could get that under control. And they obviously they would be tailored differently depending on wh- whether we're looking at the workplace or, say, a police station yep. or the home. Yeah. Okay, um, well let's 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 go on to think about this a little bit a little bit more. So, why, on your account, do you think that um, in this employment relationship we see some of these kind of practices? So, why is it that the employers introduce the kind of restrictive arrangements that you think lead to the domination of people? in this relationship? I mean, are they doing it just sort of for the sake of it? Is, is there some sort of efficiency reason that they have for these kind of practices? What do you think are the reasons why employment relationships are conducted in this way? Yeah, so that's a really great question because I think we can distinguish two different types of, of abuses of workers. One is directly associated with uh, a, some notion of efficiency, So the slaughterhouse uh, managers who don't want workers to be using the bathroom during shift, that's strictly a matter of time management. And same Mm -hmm. the whole idea of time theft. They imagine that workers can be on the job without any rest for a a whole shift. Now, that's fictional. In fact, we do know that we're organisms and we actually do need some rest and we need breaks and so forth. So it's a fundamental lack of appreciation for actually even the physiological needs of workers. Um, And, of course, that's been a classic critique of, of how employment works ever since the Industrial Revolution where human beings, workers, have been forced to work at the pace of machinery mm-hmm. rather than at their own organic pace. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but then there's another, there's a second class of regulations of worker behavior uh, that don't really have anything to do with productive efficiency and everything to do with the boss taking advantage of legal prerogatives to just, uh, you know, impose their will in domains that are rather irrelevant to production or might even undermine it. Mm -hmm. Classic case here, sexual harassment in the workplace. Mm -hmm. It actually demoralizes the workers. It's not good for efficiency. It's just the boss indulging, you know, their own whims and and Mm -hmm. lust for power. Uh, But but those abuses are made possible by a legal regime that uh, is very ineffective in many contexts in protecting workers from this kind of bullying. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, I, I'm sure you've been faced with this sort of question before, but thinking about the kind of arguments that economists would make in these kind of situations. I mean, typically people are going to argue that um, if the employment relationship is really not working out for a worker at all, if there's some of the kind of abuse that you're talking about, 
then all that really matters is are there some exit options? Is there competition operating in the labor market such that if your boss isn't treating you very well, you can go somewhere else where they can treat you better? Now, I know part of your argument is, well, when you exit, actually, you're just going to another mini dictatorship. <laughs> yes, right, exactly. Rather than, so there's not a lot of choice and variety around. But I still economists would still tend to argue that if you're in a competitive situation, um, that is going to put a kind of upward pressure on standards, um, or at least one that limits some of the kind of abuses you're talking about. Now, as I understand, I mean, there would be specific situations if you had a monopsony situation where that might not apply. And monopsony in the workplace in in labor markets has been steadily increasing in the United States. It's a Mm -hmm. serious problem. I mean, I, I think that's, I, I'm, I'm aware of the studies you're talking about that, but most economists would say, I think you certainly have situations that are like sort of company towns, maybe in some rural areas, but this will be a relatively, uh, a relatively isolated type of scenario where you've literally got, you know, a choice of one employer or two employers. I think what's more interesting about your argument, which is perhaps challenging to economists, is that, well, let's assume that the exit mechanism is working reasonably well, but the market is reasonably competitive. There are still some of these kind of practices uh, that are likely to be operative. Correct. It's empirically observed. Yeah. So one of the factors behind this, there is a difference between the professional managerial class that has some more clout uh, to protect themselves from abuse uh, because their skills are relatively scarce. They have real bargaining power. But a lot of work uh, is commodified, and it, it's, it's deliberately de-skilled uh, so that you can have pretty much infinitely replaceable workers. Many businesses have a business model of very high turnover, so the workers are subjected to horrible conditions, and maybe they only last for a few months, but that's okay. They quit, and then another pers- vulnerable person is co- brought in there, and they face abuse there's just continual turnover, and those workers really have no effective way to resist because the business model has already been set up to accommodate high quit rates. Mm-hmm. Now, those workers then go to another firm where they face the same kinds of abuses, and they, they don't, no, there's no escape. I guess the question there, again, thinking, thinking maybe more from a kind of economist angle, is why... Um, I mean, I don't think you need to assume something like a perfectly competitive market to make this kind of argument. But why isn't it the case then um, that you don't get new employers spotting a gap in the market where basically um, they could profit from the fact that there are people who are dissatisfied with the type of jobs that are in offer? Maybe they could pay people uh, less, but they would be offering them a more attractive working environment. Why doesn't the market operate in that way because if it if you've got some sort of competition you would expect some movement um, from maybe a new employer coming into the market offering different types of arrangement maybe a flatter management structure in exchange for uh, lower pay something of that kind is it something about the legal arrangement you're suggesting that actually blocks that from happening well i do think that at least in the, in the united states the default Uh, A legal role is employment at will, which means that the boss can hire and fire for any or no reason Mm -hmm. at all, uh, with only a tiny number of exceptions that mostly having to do with discrimination. Uh, So all kinds of other abuses the boss is free uh, to engage in. That's a big, I think, problem for workers. Um, But uh, on top of that, Firms tend to copy other firms in how they divide up the labor. Uh, It's a lot easier and cheaper just to copy models that are already out there. There is some economic pressure due to the demand to uh, maximize profits, to try to commodify as many workers as possible so that uh, the the firm has actually been steadily shrinking just around a small number of high skill workers with a lot of then outsourced uh, gig workers, people on temporary contracts, um, uh, you know, zero hours contracts Mm -hmm. and so forth. And those people are extremely vulnerable because they're not even considered employees. Mm -hmm. So they even have fewer rights than, uh, than the formal employees within a firm. And pretty much they can be treated however the boss Mm -hmm. wants. Mm -hmm. So, 
do you have a sense, I mean, maybe we can comment on this thinking about some of the sort of solutions you, you propose to, to some of these sort of problems later on, but, but why, for example, do we not see um, a greater movement to things like worker cooperatives? Um, I know that's something that you, you actually speak about as something quite, quite, you're quite favourable towards the idea of worker cooperatives. Why do you think that they don't arise spontaneously? Because you'd think that if, um, you know, the situation is as you described, there will be some market opportunity for someone to say, well, let's sort of cut out the boss sort of thing yes, and right. have the workers do it themselves. I mean, I guess some of the arguments that are sometimes made against worker cooperatives is actually that, you know, the kind of bullying that can come from a boss can also come from other workers. And in some situations, you might actually prefer having someone who's separate from the situation being your boss rather than a, than your co-workers. But I don't know. I mean, how do, you, how do you feel about that sort of issue? Yeah, I mean, worker cooperatives can be a very attractive model. Uh, the reason why I'm not pushing to maximize that in the current context is that workers get to be co-equals in a cooperative situation because they also actually own the firm. Yeah. So in their capacity as capital owners, they have the authority to run the firm. For the firm. Uh, but that would require workers to put up an awful lot of capital, and generally speaking, especially the, for the larger firms, they would never be able to come up with the with the capital investment required. And it might not even be an optimal investment for them because then they're putting all their eggs in one basket. Yeah. So I don't think it's I don't think it's easily universalizable. And especially you have like nonprofit organizations which are non trivial, like colleges and universities, and you don't really have shareholders anyways. Yeah. Um <clears throat> but those workers also need protection. So that's why uh in my alternative uh, I've been uh, arguing that some system like co-determination, mm -hmm. which doesn't require that workers have shares in the firm, uh, but simply that they be employed there, uh, would be a way to give workers a voice in how they are managed uh, and empower them to push back on all kinds of abuses. So that's something like, I mean, the, the, I think the model that you mentioned there is the, the German uh, model in the book. It's actually something that's been proposed in this country. Um, the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, was talking about doing this. There are people in the Labour Party who are uh, talking about, about this as well as a, as a possibility. So why do, you, why do you take the argument that market forces themselves don't lead to um, a sufficient treatment of workers? I mean, is it basically an argument that the labour market isn't sufficiently competitive? Is that the underlying cause? Or is it this kind of legal situation that you think is the... Um, yes, so I, I do think that the law of employment at will yeah. disempowers workers very profoundly. And that's yeah. a legal yeah. arrangement. Yeah, it's not something that's intrinsic to the way the actual market works itself. Well, it's it's one of the constitutive rules of the of the labor market, but of course you could redesign the labor ma market. Yeah, a and one can ask what the internal constitution of the firm is. Mm. And my point is is that the constitution of the firm uh, of firm government is part of the legal infrastructure that's set mm. by the state. Yeah. So it's not an output of open competition. The state. Yeah supplies the default employment contract hmm. and the default constitution of the firm and hmm. that default constitution is very authoritarian hmm. the state could decide that the default constitution is has a, some kind of democratic structure that hmm. uh requires representation of workers uh in management yeah. that's a state decision it's a legal decision you're not going to get people capital owners who've been dealt all the authority cards, dealing any of those authority cards back to the workers if they don't have to. Well, I mean, I think this is where you, you, you do make a very, um, very powerful challenge to sort of classical liberal or libertarian type arguments, because people from that perspective are basically making arguments that 
we ought to focus on effectively constitutional limits on government power. Uh, and there can be good reasons for thinking about those, but you're actually saying in your argument we ought to think about constitutional limitations on, on this private government power. It's government operate. power too. Why yeah. shouldn't libertarians be um, objecting to it? <laughs> but I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I guess the issue is, and I think this is a problem actually for both perspectives, mm -hmm. from for the libertarian view, I'm absolutely, perhaps also for the, for the view that you hold, of what is the baseline that we're actually comparing things against. So it's perfectly legitimate to argue that, um, you know, we don't start from some baseline, which is all free contracting mm -hmm. without some legal privileges, which might, for example, favor corporations. Mm -hmm. But it's equally not obvious what the alternative baseline might be that you have to compare things against. Mm -hmm. So there aren't any democratic structures um, that haven't arisen, for example, in many cases, without there being some form of domination mm -hmm. um, or violence even that's been used. Um, I did an, an, a really interesting podcast, I think, with um, Barry Weingast, actually, be before Christmas. Um, and he was very much sort of challenging... Um, the neoclassical economic idea that if you like in the beginning there are markets yeah uh and then we have to think about there being interferences in markets um and he says that as someone who's quite a pro-market uh economist um his view is in the beginning there's violence that human beings you know the starting point is one of violence and then you move on to get some kind of institutional solution to that but that's also a problem, I think, that argument, actually, for people who talk about democratic structures. So it's not in the beginning there's democracy. Correct. It's in the beginning there's what? <laughs> yes, I mean, that's really great. And so I, I think I want to step back a little bit and, and talk about my philosophical methodology, yeah, which is pragmatism. Yeah. So in contrast with most political philosophers who want to think up out of their heads, some ideal principles of justice, mm -hmm. and then judge institutions by their uh, shortfall from, from the ideal. that ideal. Uh, pragmatists start from problematic experiences that people have and then move to a diagnosis of what the problem really is. And with a refined enough diagnosis, the remedy can pop out of that. Uh, uh, and then, of course, you don't just do that theoretically. You put that remedy into practice, and in doing so, that will likely reveal some incompleteness in your original diagnosis or new problems arising from the remedy itself. So learning involves a constant iteration of this process of diagnosis and solution. Mm. Uh, and so eventually, you know, hopefully you get to improve over time. And that's pretty much what we see with the evolution of democracy. This is a centuries long project, democracy still under construction. And you're quite right that just because you have something like elections or representatives um, doesn't mean that you end the violence and the domination, uh, right? There, it, it, it pop these things pop up in other contexts. And so that requires more institutional innovation. And where do you think that innovation actually comes from? I mean, I guess, um, you know, I'm going back to the, to the other point about why is it that, uh, you know, in a market where uh, there is domination, there are dominating employers, we don't get innovations from employers who are more humane. Uh, coming into that market. Um, so do you see the solution just coming from from the state itself through a democratic structure, introducing regulation into these situations? Um, or do you see there being other vehicles where that might happen? Or is there some combination? I mean, is it is it something that we just learn through empirical experience? Is that the pragmatist, that aspect that... So I do want to push back on the idea that there's that there's no innovation in, in say, in management employment. techniques... Yep. Uh, towards more humane techniques. And I, I want to uh, cite the case of Richard Locke. Uh, he's a uh, at the MIT Sloan School of Business, who's done amazingly interesting work on how to improve the uh, treatment of workers in supply chains of major corporations like Nike. Um, 
And he argues, actually, that um, you, know, you outsource the manufacturer of athletic shoes to some place, you know, maybe in Thailand. Yeah. Um, and most of the small manufacturers in Thailand who are taking these subcontracts uh, have no really management training. And so they think, like, the best way to get work out of their workers might be to beat them up. Mm. <laughs> um, and Locke has actually gone out there and um, a- a- and helped these corporations implement serious management training. Mm. But actually, there's a lot that has been learned in mm. business schools about yeah. how to motivate workers by other means than uh, very harsh treatment. Yeah. Um, A lot's been learned about that, and what he discovered is most managers actually don't want to be beating up their employees. They, if they have an easier way to motivate people, (laughs) that's good for both sides. So yeah, I mean, there has been innovation within management. It's not all top down. It's not all state mandates. But I also think that even enlightened management, if it's still within a fundamentally authoritarian constitution, it still means that there's a lot of issues that employees might have with how they're being managed that they don't Mm. feel free to articulate Mm. uh, because they could get in trouble. Maybe they'll be considered a troublemaker if they raise a complaint one of the functions of labor union representation is to give voice to workers so they can articulate complaints mm. without um, losing yeah. the, their jobs or benefits or access to yeah. you know raises and things. Um, co-determination constitutionalizes that, so it's not just a contingent product of bargaining power, yeah. but workers just get it automatically as part of the constitution of firm governance i mean do those kind of mechanisms do they address the problems where um you know the 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 abuse or the domination or or the bullying in some cases um isn't only coming from the employer but might actually be coming from other employees. Yes. So yes. I know. I mean, some of the the examples <clears throat> you talk about in the book about um, employers, um, you know, having rules about what people put on Facebook or Twitter or the, some of these other kind of things. Uh, on the face of it, they seem quite you know extreme restrictions that many of us would think are unjustifiable. But then, when you go into the non-ideal world and you realise that. In some cases, um, it's other workers who are putting up, you know, racist abuse on Facebook or whatever it is, or or bullying their co-workers. Yeah. Then, you know, what do we do about those kind of situations? How does co-determination address that when part of the abuse is coming from other workers? Right. Well, you know, if workers have a problem with being bullied by other workers... That is an issue that could be raised in a co-determination context. Mm -hmm. And they could implement roles against harassment by coworkers. Yeah. Um, That that could be a thing. And I I think it's pretty important. Now, as far as speech that's totally um, off-duty, that is where the worker isn't addressing, uh, say, coworkers on social media... um, and here it doesn't matter whether they're off hours or on hours. But if they're just saying like totally obnoxious things off hours, not addressing their their coworkers, I think the case for regulation is a lot less unless they're like talking about, you know, killing people or some other violence. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of people have obnoxious beliefs. And in general, in, unless it raises to the level of threatening um I think uh, I would be reluctant to bring in the employer to mm. uh, put pressure on the worker. Coworkers might want to initiate a conversation about you know why they find these opinions problematic. Mm. Um, but I, I'd rather not uh, bring in the employer to regulate an employee's off-duty speech. Mm. No, I mean, I can see, I can see the, the arguments for that. I, I wonder if we could think about actually the empirical side of this, thinking about um, 
different mechanisms that may address this problem and how we actually compare them. So you're obviously quite sympathetic towards the German type model, this co-determination model. Um, but how do you actually compare, in a sense, the outcomes of that model with the outcomes of alternative models when there are so many different sort of moving parts of the dimensions here? Um, so what I'm thinking about there, and the example I'm you know, going to give maybe a little bit out, out of date, but certainly in Germany historically, you know, arguably partly because of the role that workers play in, um, in management, some people would suggest, that's been one of the key factors in affecting actually the, the employment status of immigrants in Germany. Um, where, you know, Turkish immigrants, for example, had temporary mm -hmm. visiting status mm -hmm. and were very much, you know, treated in the society as a sort of second-class citizens. And you could see that as being partly a, a problem of a sort of insiders in employment relationship wanting to keep other people out. Yeah. And then how do you compare a situation like that to a more liberal labour market, for example, mm -hmm. where, you know, there are some of the problems that you're talking mm -hmm. about, um, but there's also a sort of greater supply of jobs. You have a much more, much greater fluidity in the market. So how do you actually compare these situations in terms of the level of domination that's actually taking place? Right. Um, yeah, so that's a really interesting point. Um, and uh, at this point, you would really need to get people out there developing measures yeah. and looking at worker satisfaction and for, for different groups. Yep. of workers and think really seriously about what it actually takes to successfully integrate immigrants into a labor movement. Hmm. Generally speaking, I think um, the United States has, has done a pretty good job, but it has a, that is with bringing immigrants in, although the overall level of treatment of workers is pretty poor mm -hmm. compared to Europe. Are you suggesting that there's a kind of correlation between those two things? That the more liberal the labor market, the easier it is. To I think it may be easier for people to come in yeah. uh, and to integrate. Yeah. Um, and in a sense, also, if if the market is providing some more job opportunities, I mean, Germany actually does quite well in terms of you know relatively low unemployment. But if you yeah. were to compare, say, for example, in France, where unemployment is quite high, yes, yes, then the situation would be one where, well, you may have more integration in the more liberal system. Uh, you may have better workers' rights, say, in France. Yes. But you've also got workers who are excluded from the labour market. That's an excellent point. And who could point. be subject to domination out of work. Well, yes, because that employment also makes people really vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that is an excellent point, and I, you know, I'm not entirely convinced that 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 we're forced into a trade off. It seems to yeah. me that there are also cultural differences here that matter. Um, so, for instance, compare the situation of Muslims in France and Muslims in the United States. Yeah. Um, in France, I think we have a very troubled situation, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that a lot of those Muslims came from Algeria. You had a colonial context. Mm -hmm. The whole history of colonialism, I think, made toxic relationships between the, you know, the native French and the people of immigrant origins. Uh, whereas in the United States, the United States ha does have a colonial history, but it's but with respect to Muslims, it doesn't record. really apply. Uh, and, and also, the United States has like amazing religious diversity. Uh, it's never had an established church. Um, there's a new religion being invented practically every day. <laughs> yeah. There's a kind of <laughs> relaxation about these issues. So, for instance, in my classrooms at University of Michigan, I have lots and lots of Muslim women wearing hijab, and it's never been an issue. Like, nobody gets upset about this. It's just like, mm. well, there's freedom of dress, and mm. all there's all kinds of clothing that students mm. are wearing in the classroom. A and that, that cultural difference, I think, has, has made it easier. And also, the United States is a, is a nation of immigrants anyways, and yep. so we've had practice integrating immigrants from all corners of the world for centuries, literally. Um, and those habits, I think, have made it easier. So if you actually look at economic outcomes for uh, Muslims in the United States, they're actually above 
they're above average. Yep. Not not greatly, but okay. a little bit yeah. Yeah. in education, income, yeah. and general prospects. And I can see it in the ambitious in the ambitions of my male and female students who are Muslim. They're becoming doctors, lawyers, engineers. They're yeah. really moving ahead. The women as well as the men. Yeah. So I mean what I take from that, I mean, if you're thinking about the solutions to this this particular problem, is that there isn't necessarily a kind of one-size-fits-all model that you're looking for here, that this is very much a sort of pragmatic search for, <clears throat> trying to just highlight what you see as being an important problem, um, but saying maybe there are sort of multiple different types of approaches that might be required to address it, depending on, for example, what the cultural context is and how that might interact with the nature of the labor market or these other sorts of factors. Absolutely. I agree with that view. And that's really at the heart of a pragmatist point of view. Um, And so we do have to attend to local concerns, which differ from society to society in crafting solutions to these problems. I mean, I think if I was, if I was pushing here, that I, I would say, um, this sounds like one reading of pragmatism could be an argument um, for a focus on um, quite decentralized arrangements, actually, to try to tackle these problems. So one of the, the thinkers that inspires the work of this center is Eleanor Ostrom. He's very much oh, about I love Ostrom. Ostrom's such a wonderful... Polycentric yes. solutions yes. Yes. Uh, to try to address some of these kinds of, of issues. Yeah. I guess... The argument um, against perhaps that kind of view on the one hand is, well, you might, by relying on something that's polycentric or decentralized, replicate the very thing that you're trying to challenge in the first place. In this case, would the polycentric arrangements not be subject to the some of the forms of domination that you're you're talking about? Um, so, so let's keep in mind that the real beauty of Ostrom's work, so Ostrom is looking at uh, common pool resources like uh, forests that many people yep. would use or uh, irrigation or, yeah, systems, yeah, yeah. water water systems yep. in general, uh, and how local communities uh, establish governance systems so that you don't get a tragedy of the commons, yep. but everybody gets a fair share yep. of these resources. And it is true that she does stress the importance of the emergence of these institutions in the community, a kind of organic working out of differences. Um, But at the same time, her research also draws out empirically some common features of successful systems Mm -hmm. and some common features of the types of systems that don't really work out. So there is real learning here. And if you want to set up a new system, you can learn from experience, even though there will be local variations on the theme. Yeah. Uh, That's what I'm I'm thinking about. Um, so you're not going to recommend that we roll out the German style uh, no, model not everywhere? That, that, quite that. right. No, I think actually to adapt it to the U.S. context, that would require um, a lot of experimentation. Yeah. No, we can't just take the German legal infrastructure and plant it in, in the United States. Yeah. Too, there are too many other differences. You need a lot of adjustment. And do you think there are anything, any insights from you know what you're saying here about how we think about employer employment relationships, say, outside of the Western type of context. So, I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, I read a paper, I think it was a National Bureau of Economic Research paper uh, three or four years ago, which was making the argument that um, actually in many cases, foreign investment in parts of the developing world, I think the, the paper was focusing on Bangladesh specifically, is the single biggest predictor of increases in women's status. For yeah. example, mm-hmm. because people are exposed to employment relationship, it's taking them out from exposing them to a new form of life, new types of relationships. Um, and so on that view, that's a slightly more positive understanding, actually, of the role that, that corporate investment can actually play in those yes. kind of situations, because people are being exposed to different ways of life, uh, different opportunities, different conceptions, which directly improve their lives but also raise their aspirations about what they might reasonably expect and the way they may expect to be treated both at work and perhaps also at home yes well we do know that women uh get a lot more power when they can bring in outside income yeah and that's really huge and it also is frankly the case that a lot of uh uh, foreign investors actually prefer to hire women 
yep. into a lot of these jobs, uh, <clears throat> especially the uh, light manufacturing, yep. um, textiles, things like that. Um, so, yeah, that is empowering to women. But they, there's another thing, too, and that is there are advantages to formal employment hmm. uh, as opposed to informal employment where there's all, I mean, if anything, the informal sector, there's, what makes it informal is that there's really no legal infrastructure at all. And that means it's kind of even more wide open yep. in terms of the vulnerability of workers yep. in those contexts. Formalization has a lot of advantages. Yep. But then you want the formalization to be done well. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if we're just moving away from the, the specific um, theme, theme of, the, of, of this work, I wonder whether we could... Maybe maybe reflect on some of these issues, but think about um, your overall approach to political philosophy. Um, I mean, what I really much really enjoy about your work, um, and it really fits the spirit of the department here at King's, is that you bring together insights from economics um, to inform the political philosophy, um, and, and, and vice versa. Um, and that's very much in what I would call a sort of PPE tradition of, of, of research. I mean, is that something that you think is really informing this kind of project that you've been engaged with on work? And, and how do you see the state of this sort of field of um, PPE as a field of research at the current point in time? Absolutely. So I, I agree with you entirely in your description of, of how I work. It's very much PPE style. And uh, I, I think this is just a very rich way to be thinking about the problems in our society and how we can come up with uh, responsible solutions. So the way I conceive of PPE as a kind of mode of inquiry is that um, it is focused on identifying various kinds of collective action problems mm -hmm that require institutions to solve. PPE investigates a very wide variety of institutions that might, they're like tools in the toolbox for yeah. solving these problems. And some of them are formal, like property rights and markets and governments. And uh, some of them are more informal, like social norms. And we then investigate empirically uh, how we can package together hmm. these tools into more complex um, systems and organizations. Uh, and then we look at the results and see whether it actually helps people's lives. Hmm. And there is then a normative dimension to that uh, where philosophers come in uh, and, and think about the criteria of evaluation um, which don't just involve advancing human welfare, although that's like a terrific thing. Yep. <laughs> but there are also fairness, and justice considerations, and considerations of human dignity and uh, uh, esteem, and so forth. So there's, I, I'm very much in favor of a pluralist mode of evaluation, and also um, the use of consultation and democratic forms as people continuously revive their, revise their own values, their evaluative standards, their ideals, their aspirations. All of that can be studied empirically um, and is relevant to the evaluation of institutions. I mean, that's, that's certainly something that we've been trying to do here in the broader department that we're, we're, we're situated in. We really want to emphasize that PPE should be seen as an integrative sort of enterprise where the three fields are not seen as separate, that you study them separately. You actually look at ways of showing to students and actually the broader citizenry, because we mm -hmm. want educated citizens who actually understand something about these principles, how the, the three fields actually interact. Whereas I think a lot of teaching in this area and even to some extent research I guess has been very much a lot of separating them seeing them as separate and then somehow maybe you figure out that, that, that they work together we think you actually ought to start from the beginning by thinking about how they actually interact is that something that you'd be sympathetic with? oh I agree completely I mean the real payoffs of, of PPE is integrating those approaches uh, uh, otherwise you really can't make progress on the problems mm-hmm 
Well, it's, it's nice to hear you sort of uh, to say that because that's I know that's very much what we're we're about in um, in this department. So, um, well, Elizabeth, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us this afternoon. It's been afternoon. a pleasure to talk um, to you. And we are actually expecting quite a lot from you. I know you're giving a public lecture this evening and doing a, a departmental seminar. So I hope you're going to enjoy the rest of your stay here at King's this week. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome.